ಪ್ರಭವತಿಪಮ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರಭವತಿ ಜಗತ ಅನೇಕಧ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷೀನ ಕ್ಲೇಶರಾಶಿ ವಿಷಮ ವಿಷಧರ ಅನೇಕ ವಕ್ರ ಸುಭೋಗಿ ಸರ್ವಜ್ಞಾನ ಪ್ರಸೂತಿ ಭೋಜಗಪರಿಕರ ಪ್ರೀತೇ ಯೋಹೀಷ ಸ ವೋ ವ್ಯಾತ್ ಸಿತವಿಮಲತನು ಯೋಗದೋಗಯುಕ್ತ ಯೋಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಸಿಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ ಶ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಅನಂತ ನಾಗರಾಜ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ so we are in the first sutra atha yoga anushasanam last week we talked about the definitions of atha where we saw different meanings for this word atha and why basically this word is used as the first word of the yoga sutra of patanjali it's a very auspicious word and it already sets forth what is required from the student and the teacher which is a commitment what is known as pratigna and that's why the first word is atha and we spoke about that in detail last time today we will try and complete the sutra the sutra is atha yoga anushasanam the second word of the sutra is yoga yoga is in this context the topic of study so the first sutra is saying now we are going to study the yoga teachings or yoga philosophy there is one clarification that is needed from this word yoga what yoga here in this sutra is meaning is the philosophy of yoga there is also the word yoga that is used in sanskrit language that also has other meanings for example in astrology they use the word yoga nalla yoga undu means there is a good yoga at this time there the astrological word yoga is a little different from the word yoga here the word yoga here represents the patanjali's yoga darshana yoga is one of the six philosophical schools and that is what is being talked about here so this clarification is needed because when we look at the definition of yoga in a dictionary you will get many many different meanings not all of them are related to the word to the philosophy of yoga so this clarification is very necessary here that's why patanjali clarifies it with the second word following yoga anushasanam anushasanam is teaching of yoga therefore indirectly he is meaning i am now teaching you the yoga darshana the yoga philosophy so that is what we will have to discuss here and the second word yoga needs some explanation because it is the first time patanjali is using the word yoga in the third sutra patanjali will define what is yoga but before taking his definition of yoga 
it is perhaps a good idea to discuss what are the other meanings of yoga that are possible even within the context of yoga so today we will take some of the definitions of yoga or some of the meanings of yoga the first set of definitions or meanings i want to give is from a text called the amarakosha amarakosha is a very old sanskrit text it's a first dictionary of sanskrit language uh, which is created by a teacher or a person called amarasimha who was a kashmiri king and he was actually a royal king but he was also very well versed in all the indian philosophies he made this thesaurus of yoga thesaurus of sanskrit language which is called as amarakosha in this he defines yoga with he gives synonyms for yoga yoga ha sannahana upaya sangati dhyanam yuktishu yoga ha sannahanam upayam sangati dhyanam yuktishu he gives different meanings of the word yoga the first meaning of the word yoga is sangati the word sangati comes from the origin sanga sanga means to come together in indian language we always say sangam when we say sangam of people means people coming together an association of people an organization of people is called sangam sometimes we are using the word sangha to represent the confluence of rivers for example in north india we have few river confluences triveni sangama the three rivers are joining together sangha so sangha means there are different things that come together that unite that come and form a, a connection now in this context krishna macharya defined yoga in the following way with regard to the meaning sangati or sangha at the first level when body and breath come together this is yoga this is sangati this is what we are doing in asana practice we are trying to bring body and breathing together to form a union so that they move together he also said yoga is also the sangati of body senses and prana sometimes the senses are leading us one way not where we want to be so bringing together body senses prana and therefore also mind is yoga this is also what is sangati when things are coming together it is called sangati sangam there is also another definition he gives the sangati of what is called mind prana and jivatma he says for those who are believers of jivatma the concept of sangati is the confluence of mind prana and jivatma jivatma is our consciousness so you see how many possible meanings can be given here for yoga as a sangati coming together he says for those who are believers what he calls astikyas yoga is the sangati of jivatma and paramatma in the vedic school we have the belief that there is individual consciousness that is unique to each of us but there is one supreme consciousness that is the collective consciousness of the entire world so yoga is the union of jivatma and paramatma this is also coming under the definition of sangati because sangati means bringing things together so in as way yoga is a process of bringing things together yoga is not separation of things what separates us is ego when we say i belong to this sangam and i belong to that sangam we are separating ourselves we from one community to another it's based on ego we say i belong to this country i belong to that country it is separation based on ego so ego is dividing but yoga is uniting that's what is the first meaning of the word yoga which is sangati please remember this is not definition according to patanjali it's the meaning of the word yoga from amarakosha sangati union 
the next meaning he gives is yogaha upayam yoga is a upayam upayam means a means a tool why do we need a means why do we need a tool it's a means or a tool to achieve some destination say i want to go from here to another part of chennai i need an upayam now that upayam can be my legs i can walk that upayam can mean a car that upayam can mean a bicycle so i need a vehicle that takes me from a to b similarly yoga is a vehicle is a means that takes us from where we are to another point the goal now in this definition yoga is the vehicle that takes us from what is called su dukkha to sukha we are suffering in this world we are having suffering we are having difficulties we need to come out of this difficulty we need to move from dukkha to sukha so we move from a place where we feel constricted to a place where we feel more free that is why yoga is a tool to help us move from dukkham to sukham similarly from the vedic point of view they def- define this slightly differently they say we are all bound we are trapped we feel trapped by the ego by the senses by the world around from that we have to move to freedom moksham kaivalyam whatever word you want to use so yoga is a means for us to be more free less trapped so yoga is an upayam yoga is an upayam there is also another way to look at this the word upa means near the word aya comes from the root ay to move ayanam to move that's why vayu also shares the same root because vayu moves wind moves so upa ay upaya upayam means that which moves us nearer we saw nearer the goal but yoga is also a tool that moves us nearer to ourself what is in our heart now again here the vedic school defines this differently what is in the heart can be the jivatma or what is in the heart can be paramatma however you want to look at it because the vedic school says that the what is in our heart is consciousness the consciousness is either individual consciousness or the divine consciousness or collective consciousness but it is a form of consciousness it is full of light so that is what is in our heart yoga is a means that takes us there closer to that and when we go closer to that the consciousness reveals itself we should never get confused we must not think that yoga reveals the consciousness it takes us closer and if you go closer the consciousness may choose to reveal itself because in the vedic schools they say about the consciousness they say atma tattvam svaprakashatvam atindriyam anamayam the the tattva the reality of consciousness is svaprakashatvam it is self revealing no <clears throat> it's what i say is the difference between like a dog and a cat you go near a dog the dog comes near you it's very happy to be near you it wants to jump on you it wants you to play with it etc but as if you go near a cat it does not mean the cat will come near you if it wants it will come towards you the same way when you go near the consciousness yoga is taking you closer either the consciousness will reveal itself or maybe not that's not only in our hands there are other factors as well that we have to be considering so that is what is upayam 
it's a means that takes us nearby then yoga ha sannahana upaya sorry sangati we saw sangati and upayam sannahanam another meaning of yoga is sannahanam the word sannahanam means a protection another synonym for this is what is called kavacham it's a protection we say in the mahabharata they say karna was born with the kavacham he was born with a protective shell yoga the protective armor is yoga what it means is that when we practice yoga yoga will protect us yoga will protect us from disease yoga will protect us from old age etc the hatha yoga pradipika if you read they say so many different ways in which yoga takes care of us from bad circumstances yoga protects us from dukham so yoga is a sannahanam sannahanam means a protection and we can all see this that's why yoga is a very good form of therapy for so many people because when people practice yoga they become healthy so yoga in some way is protecting them from diseases now it can be therapeutic after a disease has come or it can be therapeutic by preventing diseases from coming because usually protection when you wear when a soldier wears an armor that is what is the literal meaning of kavacham it protects him from the enemy so it's almost like yoga will prevent many diseases that come before the disease can come that is what is sannahanam or kavacham dhyanam yoga is dhyanam dhyanam is meditation one of the most important definition of yoga is meditation dhyanam meditation is defined in yoga as the process of being very deeply connected with an object of focus that is usually an auspicious object not any object not a sense object but an auspicious object what acharya krishna macharya says divya shubha ashraya divya means something that is spiritual spiritually oriented shubha auspicious positive ashraya an object of focus that's why in india we have so many meditative focuses like sun moon etc in that kind of auspicious manner in the classical sampradaya they are not asking you to meditate on sense objects like an apple or a banana or something like that they are usually asking you to meditate on object that are spiritually oriented that is auspicious or positive so yoga is a process of connecting deeply with an object of focus that is what is called dhyanam and when we meditate on that object of focus what yoga says is we acquire those qualities that's why it should be positive because when we meditate on a focus that is positive we will acquire those positive qualities when we meditate on something that is negative we will acquire negative qualities this is very very important to understand yukti yoga is also defined as yukti the word yukti means a superior intelligence yoga refines the mind removes the obstacles of the mind so that the mind is having the capacity of yukti the mind is having a capacity of yukti sometimes we use in tamil language yukti oda seiva that means you do it in an intelligent way you do it in a careful way so the word yukti means basically that the mind has the capacity of a superior intelligence now this is very important because yoga does not say that one person is more intelligent than the others yoga says each of us our mind has the capacity for brilliance the only problem is some people have more obstacles some have lesser obstacles 
So that's why yoga is defined here as the process of refining the mind so that the higher intelligence is possible. The mind is capable of that. And that's why when you are practicing yoga, you will see that the flow of prana becomes more efficient and therefore more deeper minds are becoming accessible. This, we will see this in the later sutras. In the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, they are saying that we have different kinds of minds. Some are more subtle, some are more gross. Each of us have this. And the more subtle minds are the more intelligent minds, more the, the mind that has more wisdom. Now that depends, that mind's activation depends on the efficient flow of prana. To take a metaphor, when you have different bulbs of light, each with different voltage, suppose one power is only 10 watts. Now you only need 10 watts of electricity for that bulb to illuminate. Whereas another bulb is 100, you need 100 watts of electricity to illuminate that. So it depends on how much prana is there. The same way, when the more efficient prana is flowing in, the, in our system, the more subtle minds become activated. And therefore, that mind is capable of better functioning. That's what is the yukti. So these are some of the definitions of yoga from the point of view of Amarakosha. This is very important for us to remember because these are synonyms for the word yoga, not the definition that Patanjali will give in the next sutra. In this sutra, when writing a commentary on this sutra, Acharya Krishnamacharya defines yoga as a samskara. Yoga is a samskara. Samskara means a preparation. In the Sanskrit language, the word samskara has many meanings. One of them is a preparation. <clears throat> samskaro nama uttara karma yogyata dhanam. To give you a simple metaphor, when we are cooking, we are using a vessel. We make rice in that vessel and then we put that rice to eat. But we want to make something else in that vessel, let's say a lentil in that vessel, a dal we want to make. We want to use the same vessel because we are very poor, we only have one vessel. We don't immediately use the same vessel. <clears throat> First what we do, we clean the vessel so that it becomes fit for the next act. That is what is Uttara Karma Arhata. Uttara Karma means the next act. Arhata means the capacity, it becomes capable. <clears throat> so, this is what is Samskara, the process of preparing for the next act. What are we preparing? We all have only one body. This body has to do all the actions of the daily life with the mind, with the senses. We have one set of body, mind and senses. We don't say, okay, for teaching, I will use this body. For cooking, I will use another body. For taking care of children, I will use another body. The same body, the same mind is going to function other functions as well. And one set of functions needs one kind of preparation. Suppose I have to teach a class, I need my body and mind to function one way. But what have I been doing before? I have been sleeping and then I wake up and I have to give a morning class. I can't just come from sleep and directly give a class. I need some steps to prepare the body to become awake for the next class. This is short term. But there is also long term. We have different kind of responsibilities at different stages of life. When we are young, we have to study in school, we have to study in college, etc. 
So the act that the main act for the body is learning. The next act when we enter the second stage of life, what is called the middle ages, the adult age, the responsibilities changes. We have responsibilities of children, we have responsibilities of job, we have responsibilities towards our colleague to guide our colleagues, etc. The body and mind as another preparation. So, samskara is also preparation from various stages of life. So, that's why yoga is a samskara, means yoga prepares us for the next act, either short term or long term. Ultimately, from the point of view of Krishna Macharya, even at the last stage of life, it prepares us for the next stage because from the point of view of the Visishta Dvaita philosophy, after we die, there is a journey for the Jivatma continuing. So that's why yoga is called a Purusha Samskara. It prepares our Purusha for its journey towards the Paramatma. So it's not wasted just because, oh, I am old now. I don't need any preparation. I can just die. So I don't need to worry about what I do in my old age. No, the old age also we have to do some steps so that the journey for the consciousness in the next step of our life, the next journey is well prepared. It's our responsibility. So that is why this is called as a samskara. So these are the ideas that come from the word yoga ha samskara ha. This is the definition or the meaning given to the word yoga by Acharya, Krishna Acharya. Another <clears throat> concept of yoga he presents through a verse Maruthari Ramatarkshya Bija Sankalanat Imam. Yogam Khagola Bhogola Vasibhyo Jeevanam Viduhu. It's a very beautiful definition which he presents in the form of a verse. He says the word yoga comes from four syllables. Ya. Yam. Am. Um. And Gam. So these four syllables make the word yoga. The yam syllable contributes the ya. A syllable contributes a. So ya plus a becomes ya. That ya plus u becomes yo. Yo plus the ga syllable becomes ga yoga. So four syllables define what is yoga. This is what is coming from what is called bija. Bija Sankalanat Imam. Every Sanskrit word has root syllables. So here he says there is the root syllables Yam, Am, Am, Um, Gam. Each of these has special meaning. And he defines Yam, Marut. Marut means the wind, the breath. So yoga starts with the breath, prana. Yoga is connected or starts with prana. Prana is the main means of yoga. If you read more into the sutras as well as the Hatha Yoga texts etc. You will see that prana is the most important tool of yoga. So prana is the tool of yoga, main tool of yoga. And where is it going to take us? Hari. Hari rep is represented by the A syllable. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Aksharanam Akarosmi. The A syllable represents Paramatma, the divine consciousness. So, the goal of yoga is to go towards the divine. This is Krishna Macharya's definition. He says, Ultimately, we must reach the divine. That's the goal. Prana is the means. <clears throat> Paramatma is the goal. But in the Vedic philosophy, they say, you cannot just go to the Paramatma 
without the help of somebody without a medium that medium is ukara represented by the ukara the u syllable rama marut hari rama tarksha rama represents the goddess lakshmi who is the consort of the divine now in the metaphoric language this represents all the good characters values we say goddess lakshmi represents the wealth but wealth is not financial wealth here in tamil we say <clears throat> there are 16 wealths if you look at the 16 wealth none of this is about money it's all about good nature good qualities etc and this is where the role of yama niyama etc come that we have a good value system we have a good life uh, how we see life how we see each other reality of things satyam ahimsa etc is all included in this goddess definition through that we will reach the paramatma but this journey cannot be done with the help of somebody that is tarksha tarksha is represented by the ga syllable tarksha is a synonym for garuda in vedic mythology garuda represents the teacher the teachings so at some point we need a teacher who can guide us through the process so that we reach the paramatma so that is what krishna macharya says as the meaning of the word yoga marut hari rama tarksha bija sankalanatimam yogam khagola bhugola vasibhyo jeevanam viduhu this definition of yoga is what is valid for those who are living in this earth in this world or the higher world khagola means the heaven bhugola means the earth vasibhya the people who are living so this definition of yoga holds good for those who are living in the earth or in the heaven so this his definition of the word yoga so some of these are the meanings for the word yoga that fit this second word of the first sutra atha yoga anushasana now we look at the word anushasanam the final word the word anushasanam comes from the root shasu anushishtau anushasanam is a kind of teaching that has to be followed shasu anushishtau anu means to follow shishtau it has the teaching that has to be followed when you say that it's a teaching that has to be followed what is the meaning of this that means there is a teacher there is a follower so patanjali is making it very clear that yoga is a teaching that needs to be followed under the direction of a teacher but yoga is not something that you can learn from a book in the vedic school they say certain teachings are anushasanam that has to be learned from a teacher certain things can be jignyasam it can be learned through intellect for example they list music gandharva shastram it cannot be learned from a book music needs a teacher they also include cooking cooking also should be learned from a teacher in the old days the grandmother or the mother was the teacher usually music arts they say must be learned from a teacher similarly adhyayanam chanting must be learned from a teacher yoga must be learned from a teacher so they give certain examples of teaching that are only to be learned from a teacher the same we can extend this list in modern times we can extend this list for example you cannot learn swimming by reading a book 
you have to enter the swimming pool and there must be somebody who teaches you swimming so you can learn how to swim because we are not fish who are born to swim so we have to learn with a teacher similarly how to ride a bicycle you cannot learn in a book you have to learn from somebody who knows how to ride a bicycle somebody who does not know how to ride a bicycle cannot teach you that is what is anushasanam anushasanam is a teaching that you have to follow from a teacher who has followed that teaching that's what makes it continuous therefore by using the word anushasanam what patanjali is doing is that he is acknowledging his own teacher he is saying i have learned this from my teacher i am now teaching you it's not based on what i have learned from a book i am teaching you what has been taught to me i have followed it and i am teaching you this is very remarkable and there is something we have to remember from this and that's why we have to underline this word because patanjali is not the inventor of yoga he makes it clear here he doesn't say i discovered yoga <clears throat> he is saying i followed yoga he is the author of this school which is presenting the yoga teachings the first time he doesn't say i discovered yoga school and in the vedic philosophy we say that the yoga school comes from <clears throat> hiranya garbha that is another name for paramatma hiranya garbha is another name for paramatma so <clears throat> the origin of yoga who created yoga is the divine itself and it, it is explained in the vedas that when the divine took the first act of creation when he created prana that was his first yoga it's explained in the upanishads so yoga is not discovered by patanjali this is one thing that comes out of this word anushasanam another important definition of anushasanam anushasanam comes from the two parts anubhava shasanam <clears throat> yoga is an anubhava shasanam anubhava means an experience shasanam represents the teaching so anushasanam is a teaching that can be experienced so what patanjali is saying here is what i am presenting to you is an experiential science everything that i am going to say from now on you can experience through practice and some efforts like detachment from certain things it's not fantasy so every principle that is presented in the yoga sutra philosophy is an experience so patanjali is saying i have experienced this teaching and now i am teaching you from my experience so that you can also experience so yoga is not intellectual many times we want to understand yoga in the mind sankhya school is intellectual sankhya which is the predecessor of yoga gives a lot of intellectual arguments and discussions and it makes a lot of intellectual inquiries that's why many times sankhya is called the knowledge behind yoga school because it is intellectual but yoga is practical yoga is saying you, are, you can experience that's why yoga is sometimes called the practice of sankhya philosophy the practical side of sankhya philosophy so patanjali's teaching yoga teaching is an anushasanam and when you say this 
it brings us to realize one more concept when you say something is not intellectual it means yoga is not in concerning the brain yoga is not a brain function even though they talk about mind we will see this later when we talk about chitta vritti but when we say experience yoga is a something that we experience with the heart we experience with the heart so that's why yoga is an experiential science it's a movement from the mind to the heart from the brain towards the heart so we cannot try to understand yoga in an intellectual manner we have to understand it through experience so that is what is the meaning of the word anushasanam so when you look at this these three words these three words set the orientation of the entire text the entire text is about an experiential study it is about a teaching that has to be followed with a teacher it is a teaching where we have to be making a commitment atha it's a long term process and we have to be in the present moment we cannot be in the past or in the future and what links all of this is yoga the word yoga we talked about the word yoga as a sangati bringing together my grandfather made another interpretation of this through the sutra why is the sutra represented in this order atha yoga anushasanam and not another way atha represents the ready student anushasanam represents the experienced teacher yoga brings the two together this is what is meant 